don't even know if I was old enough to even watch the movie. But as I got older and grew to love the movie, I heard so many people saying, I don't know why they casted her in the first place. Billy Holiday is big. Donna Ross is skinny. I'm like, but did she do it? Did she do the movie good? Okay? Was you was you happy? to get anxiety because um, I'm fitting to go home in a spell and um, I'm trying to make sure that everything is in order okay like trying to get these uh, videos like a week or two in advance so when I get home I can just chill and enjoy my family and don't have to worry about recording videos for you guys because I know you use my videos as your morning coffee which I love that's why I feel bad if I don't give you guys a video every morning or at least every weekday morning but at any rate I love bugs if you have not already done so please remember to like share to Facebook subscribe and visit uptopbeauty.com and if you are not already a part of this book club, please remember to hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes you, can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's continue talking about uh, Call Her Miss Ross, the unauthorized biography of Diana Ross by Randy Terrebo Lele. Lovingly called JT. The month after Gordy decided to bankroll the script for the Billie Holiday story, he received the preliminary screenplay from Fury and Weston. He called Diana into his office and recorded the meeting on tape so that he could later send it to the producer and director. There was some question in her mind as to whether she wanted to make the movie, but Barry knew how to take care of that. He appealed to her fascination with Barbara Streisand by telling her that Streisand would do it if she were black. Suddenly, Diana became very interested. But why are there so many scenes in this movie, she asked. I mean, this is so long. How am I going to remember all of this? Why can't there be just four or five scenes, Barry replied. Because this is a movie, Diane. A movie has 50, 100 scenes, 200, and you're going to be in every one of them. But listen, don't worry about it. They want you. They want you bad. Jesus Christ, they came to me three times with this thing. Originally, Lady Sings the Blues was to be episodic, dealing with each of Billy's relationships with three husbands, but Barry decided that the three romances were too confusing. At his insistence, Fury and Weston agreed to combine all three into one, the one she had with Louis McKay for dramatic unity. But that's not truthful, Diana argued. It's not the way it happened. According to Diana, she said, oh no, what you're not going to do is make uh, me, the black girl, look like a junkie whore. That's not what you want to do. Now, I may be a junkie. You're not going to have me running through three different ding-dongs in one movie. That's not going to happen. So now I kind of understand why they only featured really one man in Aretha Franklin's life in the Respect movie, okay? Because you don't want your star to be portrayed, portrayed as, you know, somewhat of a, you know, us. That's Diana Ross. They don't want Diana Ross's reputation 
to be all, you know, tainted by the fact that she sucking and kissing all over uh, three different dudes. And you know, Bird and Gordy, he can't handle that pressure. What? He about to watch uh, his Diana suck on uh, three different men? Diana said that white people certainly don't worry about changing the facts to make good movies. Why should we be saddled with it just because we're black? Barry financed the writing of a revised screenplay, which was then submitted to every movie studio and source of financing in Hollywood. No one wanted it. It quickly became apparent that the rest of Hollywood wasn't quite as enthusiastic about the Ross and Gordy entrance into, film make, into the filmmaking community as were Weston and Fury. With the exception of an occasional Sidney Portier film, black movies and black screen stars were not considered money makers. Except for Eddie Murphy, they still aren't today. You know, this is you know, back in the day, you know, but still, even still, I, I, we still don't draw in the numbers the way that uh, white movies do, unless it's pa Black Panther. Until the early 70s, the black woman's image on the screen had been largely confined to broad Hattie Daniel and Butterfly McQueen-like portrayals. Lena Horne had really been Hollywood's only black screen legend. But at about the time Lady Sings the Blues was being hawked around town, Hollywood was about to realize a huge and untapped box office market in the black community. Frank Yabians received his copy of the script of Lady Sings the Blues on the first day of his new job as president of Paramount Pictures. He immediately called Weston and offered him a deal. By six o'clock that evening, he had agreed that Paramount would finance the film to the tune of $2 million. Today, it would cost at least 15 times that to do the same film. Film critics, jazz purists, and holiday fans lashed out against what they saw as outrageous casting. Diana certainly bore no resemblance to the buxom holiday, and she had nothing in common with her musically. It also seemed that she simply hadn't had enough life experiences to draw upon to bring Billie Holiday's tortured existence to screen. To a certain extent, that was true. She and Holiday were very different in terms of their upbringing and lifestyles. At first, Diana was hurt by the negative reaction to her upcoming film debut. My God, what had I done to deserve this resentment? And from my own race and people, she said, girl, I don't know why. I don't know. I, that would have been a blow to me. I'm like, Joe, why aren't you happy about the fact that I have a good role? I can do this. Just trust me. But man, when I tell you, I remember people hating on that girl about that movie. I don't even know if I was old enough to even watch the movie. But as I got older and grew to love the movie, I heard so many people saying, I don't know why they casted her in the first place. Billy Holiday is big. Donna Ross is skinny. I'm like, but did she do it? Did she do the movie good? Okay. Was you, was you happy? Months before shooting began, Diana immersed herself in the Billy Holiday legend in preparation for recording the soundtrack album. The thought of singing blues and jazz was intimidating to her at first. So much so that someone suggested she simply lip sync in the film to Holiday's recordings. You know Diana DeRoss ain't finna do that. You want me to lip sync? Bitch, I'm Diana DeRoss. If you put any challenge in front of me, brother, I'm gonna do it. When okay. people insulted her, that's an insult to me. What? You want me to lip sync? Rich, are you crazy? The double album soundtrack to Lady Sings the Blues contains some of Diana's best work by far. But when I tell you how she sang those songs touched me and moved me so deeply, okay? Oh my, good morning, honey. Ooh, oh, what a little moonlight can do. Oh, baby, ooh. The double album soundtrack to Lady Sings the Blues contains some of Diana's best work by far. Many women have attempted to cover Billie Holiday's music, Peggy Lee, Judy Garland, and dozens of others have recorded songs like I Cried For You and God Bless The Child with their own style and approach. 
but though technically proficient, their performances never seemed to fully capture the humanity that was Billie Holiday, except for Diana Ross. You will not take that from her, bitch. You will not take that from her. Most critics were absolutely dumbfounded by the excellence of these recordings. Ooh, hey, what a little moonlight can do. Oh, my goodness, baby. Ooh. Once she felt satisfied with the recording sessions, Diana became consumed by the Lady Sings the Blues project. She continued her research into Holiday's life by studying photographs to associate facial expressions and postures and the fact that she probably had bad feet. She even noticed the combs, brushes, and peanut brittle wrappers in photos of her dressing room. She began asking questions about drug abuse of people she knew to be addicted or who had quit. She read up on Lenny Bruce's life. She interviewed people who had known Billy personally. While Diana studied for her role, Jay Weston discovered that dealing with Gordy and the Motown structure was not easy. An unhappy moment for me came when I found I had to share production credit with some Motown lawyers, James S. White formerly of the William Morris Agency. He said, Motown is not an easy partner to be in business with. I found dealing with Barry and his people extremely difficult. Motown originally did not have production credit, but through various influences, the movie became a Western Fury Motown production. Uh, so I wanna know what the various influences were. Was it the mafia? Okay, was it them ninjas that really own it? Was that dude Rosh Kyle kind, whoever he was? Was he the one that placed the call and was like, oh, wait, hey, ho, 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 ho. Listen, you know we over here making this film with Diana, okay? You know, okay? You know she making this film, right? They ain't trying to give us more money, so we need to backdoor them, okay? Send, send Hammy, Knuckles, and thumbs over there to talk to them, to the Western and the Fury people, okay? Because, you know, no, answer no. That's not going to happen. Not with, no, 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 no. Barry, who had made it clear that his major interest was in Diana Ross's future, now began to ignore the rest of the Motown family. By delegating more responsibilities and power to others at the company, most of these people were white like attorney Ralph Seltzer. Ralph Seltzer, ain't that the one who Abdullah kicked his ass? Yeah, I think that's the one that Abdullah kicked his ass. He deserved it, because he don't know how to talk to people. And collections man, Barney Ellis, both of whom had been with the company since the early 60s. In fact, by 1974, of Motown, eight vice presidents were white. Seven years later, whites would hold four out of every five power positions at Motown. The Motown offices were officially located in Los Angeles. While the move to the West Coast proved great for Gordy's kingdom, it was devastating to Detroit's blacks. Motown had stood as a symbol of what a black man could accomplish with business acumen and organization. So when Gordy and Motown moved from Detroit, it left a void in the community that had given the company its start. Around this time, Martha Reeves returned to Detroit from Europe and called the Motown offices to see if any recording dates were scheduled for her. Oh, they moved, she was told by the answering service. They what? They all moved to California, girl, but nobody told me nothing about that, Martha said. Well, girl, they gone. Now 
If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Now remember this, the same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down, my naysayers, my patron loves. You babies, have a good one. Ooh. Now, if you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Now, remember this. The same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. My naysayers, my patron loves you babies. Have a good one.